Come on, church, let's stand up and worship this morning. We sing, it's a glorious day. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried but to hide It was my turn Till I met you Come on, let's sing this out you called my name and I ran out of that grave Church, let's sing about his mercy today. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all. Sing it out, I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. But you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. When you call my name Church, give them a shout of praise this morning. It's to your glorious day. It's to your glorious day. Give them some praise. Let's sing this song, this blessing over you, over your family. Let's sing this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you today and give you peace. Let's sing this today, church. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
today. Come on, let's sing it again. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine the bowl and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give upon you in a thousand generations on your family and your children and their children we declare that may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children his presence go before you and behind all you around and you. beside you all around you and within you he is with you he in is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you, 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 he is for you. Yes, he is. He is for you, he is And your family, and 
the children and the children and the children his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your glory in your weeping your weeping and rejoicing Yes, he is for you, church. He is for you. Father, may your presence go before us. May it be around us, behind us, all around us, surrounding our homes, surrounding our cars, surrounding our families, surrounding our children as we send them off to school in the next few days. Father, may your presence surround us. May your peace guide us. May your joy be active in us. Father, I pray that we would be men and women that walk in peace, that are guided by peace, that look to you for peace. Father, we love you today. We know that you want to do something great in this place, that you want to get a hold of something in us, and you want to change something in us, change the way that we think, change the way that we live. And so, Father, we invite you to get a hold of our hearts today. Father, let our hearts be sensitive to you. Let our eyes be open to you. Let our ears be open to hear your goodness. Father, we love you. It is an honor to be in your house today. In your great, powerful name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning. 
Man, at this time, if you're in fifth or sixth grade, we've got a class just for you guys. So we invite you to head out the exit doors in the back for a fifth and sixth grade meetup. And also, if you would, take some, take, take some time to get to know somebody around you. Just give them a, a virtual high five, air high five. Give them a look. Give them a head nod. Get to know somebody around you. Say hello. This is, this is way better than last week or the week before. Like people are talking and loving on each other, right? Yeah. Seriously, every week it's a, little bit, it's a little bit more normal in this room and I love it. Just seeing you guys here, it's, the room is filling up. I can barely tell that we even have every other row marked off anymore. So thank you guys for being here. My name's Josh. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Timber Creek, and I just want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us, um, and also online. I know there's some people that are still watching online, and that's great too. We're glad that you're watching or that you're here with us. If this is your first time, or maybe you just haven't connected with us in the past, would you do me a favor and just text TC New to 97,000? If you'll do that, it'll give us a chance to connect with you. We just want to serve you, get to know you, and be available to you in any way that we can. So if you haven't done that, please do that so that we can connect with you. Um, also, in just a minute, we're going to have a baby dedication. But before we get to that, offering is still looking a little different these days. And so thank you for giving. That part hasn't changed. You guys have done an amazing job there, and we appreciate that. But in order for you to give today live, if you want to give here with us, on your way out, there'll be some boxes that you can drop off a check or, or if you want to give that way. But you can also give through text, and you should see that up on the screen. And then also you can give online. So all those details are right behind me. Um, but thank you for giving. I'm going to pray over that offering that God will use that for His glory and His kingdom. And I'm also going to pray, as Jeremiah mentioned, students are going back to school, right? Um, albeit a little weird for a lot of students. It, it may not feel normal, but we're going to pray over the students, over the teachers, over the faculty and the staff of the schools, um, that God would have his way, that it wouldn't be a normal school year. And I don't just mean COVID. It'll be an abnormal school year that we'll see God show up in schools in a new way that hasn't happened, right? All right. So let's pray that together and pray over the offering. And then Steve's going to come and we'll have a baby dedication. Lord, God, please, for your glory, for the sake of your name, we pray that you would show up in our students and through our students as they go back to school, that you will show up in the schools. Lord, there's an opportunity here that things look different because of COVID, because of uh, online classes and offline classes and weird schedules different that people would turn to you and that it would happen in our school systems here in Colorado and that we would see you show up. I pray a blessing over Christian students and teachers that they would be able to speak your word in your name. Protect them, keep them safe, Lord. I pray that school, school would become more and more normal for our students, that they wouldn't have to remain in this weird limbo state, but that it can go back to normal and yet stay not normal because you are going to show up this year in a new way. In Jesus' name we pray. And also, I ask, Lord, that you would bless this offering, that you would bless the money as it would go to forward your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, everybody. It is so good to see everybody. All the new faces, all the faces, I don't want to say old faces, but all the faces that have been uh, coming for months and months, and uh, it's just so good to see. We have today the Slaymaker family. <laughs> this is Hananiah. Oh, very cute baby. Kira asked me to say, I asked her, I said, we need a picture to put up on the big screen. She goes, I'm gonna send you a whole bunch you pick. There's no way I could have gone that many 
Anyway, here at Timber Creek Church, we dedicate babies rather than baptize. We believe that baptisms are for a decision when a person decides themselves as they get older that they accept Christ into the heart. That's an outward uh, presentation that they have when they, they get baptized. So we do that later on. A baby dedication is a commitment on the part of the parents and of this church that they will take care of this child, provide opportunities and guidance and love and care and the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles and the cousins that I see here, that that's what uh, this is all part about. Daniel and Kira have committed to raise Hannah, Hananiah, in a godly home to bring her up and nurture and instruct her into the Lord according to Ephesians 6, 4, to be an example of Christ's love and pray for their child. And we as the church can continue to pray for them and her and Landon. Good morning. Kira and Daniel have chosen this verse to mark this occasion. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And I take Hananiah from mom and dad as a symbol of them releasing her to God. Say hi to everybody. And now we'll pray over her, trusting that God will be with her. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for Hananiah. We are thankful from the top of her head to the tips of her toes to the perfect toes and the perfect face and the perfect nose. And Lord, we ask that you be with her and guide her in all her steps. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And then I hand her back to mom so that she'll be more happier. But that... <laughs> hand her back and now we'll pray over the family that they will have their hand over her at all times and God will give them the guidance and the wisdom they need. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Slave Maker family. We are thankful for the love they have for you and that love they have for you shows through to their children. They uh, will guide them and give them the wisdom, godly wisdom, as they go throughout their life. And Lord, just give Daniel and Kira the wisdom and knowledge for protection over their children and little Hananiah and just walk with them always. And Lord, we just ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. This is a blanket that was made for Hananiah to always keep her in God's love. It, uh, the staff and uh, pastors, we prayed over it. Uh, just a blessing over that blanket and so thank you thank you guys is anyway that's it that's into this part <laughs> I'm gonna start crying So glad to have you with us here at Timber Creek, whether you are with us in person or you're checking us out online, we're grateful uh, just to be able to do church together today. We said this uh, when we came back, when we started gathering again just about a month ago, we said we're going to be grateful for every single Sunday that we get together. Can I get an amen on that? All right, so we're able to worship together again. Glad that you guys have joined us. My name's Patrick and I'm the lead pastor here and it is really just a pleasure 
uh, to have you guys with us today. My, one of my favorite things to do in church, baby dedications. And so uh, this is awesome. Like We just love seeing God do great things in families and through families. And so we're glad that you guys are here with us today. Um, uh, as Josh mentioned just a minute ago, everybody's headed back to school in this next week or so. And uh, for most families, that means that you kind of settle into some new rhythms. Whatever that looks like for you in this kind of crazy season, typically fall means that we step back into some rhythms that we uh, carry throughout the, the school year. And so what that means for me as a pastor is that I get the opportunity to catch up on how all of your summer travels have gone. And, and uh, man, it's so exciting just to see what, I don't know, when you take all of the job requirements of going into offices and you kind of throw them up in the air and you jumble them around, if you can find space in there to make the most out of traveling with your family, you got to do it, right? You just got to do it. How many of you guys took some advantages of that over the course of the last few months, traveled some places? All right. Well, I'm glad that you guys are here today. And it seems like over the course of the last four weeks, I've gotten to see almost every face in our church at some point, just kind of rotating through here. And so I'm glad that you guys are uh, checking us out today and, and uh, grateful again that we get to meet. Um, I want to encourage you guys to be with us next week. Next week, we've got a big announcement. Now, here's the deal. Last time that we made a big announcement, if you guys were here, you remember my wife was the one who made the announcement, and it almost sounded like we were pregnant, like we were expecting right? Which was not the case at all. And I promise you that's not the case again, but you're going to want to be here next week. We've got some great news to be able to share with you. And so you're not going to want to miss this. Over the, the course of the last few months now, we have been taking a look at many of the parables of Jesus that he told to his followers. And we've come to recognize that there is just this tremendous power found in these stories. And Jesus used these stories. He, he used them to reframe and to, to unlock the truth of the kingdom for a lot of the, his uh, followers who were having a hard time connecting with just typical teachings. And I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would be in that category. I, I, I'm the kind of person who I need a story to help me relate. And so a lot of these stories were very short, actually, but they packed these powerful truths that helped his followers and those listeners to just understand his teachings in a, a deeper way. It, helped, uh, it, made, it made the teachings more understandable. It made them more relatable. It made them more memorable. Jesus told stories about forgiveness. He told these stories about the importance of living out stories about what influences your life, what you allow and guarding those things. He told stories about the value and if you teach teachings of this series, I really encourage you to go check it out on our website, timbercreek.co. Uh, today I'm going to be wrapping up the series, and there's a parable I want to look at today about a donkey. Now, some of you guys are like, uh, that's made up, isn't it? Because that sounds more like a joke, doesn't it? You're right, you got me. My jokes are not very good. But did, did you hear the joke? Uh, did you hear the time about the, the duck that went into a bar? And he went up to the bartender and he said, hey, do you have any grapes? The bartender said, no, we don't carry grapes. The next day, the duck walks into the bar and he says, do you have any grapes? And the bartender says, no, I told you we don't have any grapes. The third day, he walks into the bar, do you have any grapes? And the bartender is just frustrated now. And he's like, listen, I've told you three times, we don't have grapes. You ask me again, I'm going to nail your feet to the floor. He comes back the next day and he says, do you have any nails? And the bartender said, no. He said, good, do you have any grapes? <laughs> All right, come on. Some things never change, like the quality of my jokes. Hey, today we are in this series, and we're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 18. And we've talked how, uh, throughout this series, we've talked how context is so incredibly important when you're trying to understand the stories that Jesus is telling here. And so Luke actually provides the context for us. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. Here's what he said. This is the context. Jesus told this parable to some people who thought they were better than others and who looked down on everyone else. So th this is where Jesus is going. Jesus and arrogance in the chops in this story. 
And as you read through scriptures, you see that Jesus is very opinionated on this topic. In fact, humility was kind of the dominant theme surrounding this parable that he tells in Luke. Passages before and after, he's talking all about humility. And he's drilling down on this topic, and for a really good reason. Pride, according to second, or 1 John chapter 2, pride is one of the three big killers Greed, lust, and pride will take you out. They will take you out. And so I want to invite you today to just lean in a little bit because as I've I've realized how difficult it is to see pride in my own life. And so there's a, when I told you the topic that we're studying today, that immediately in your mind you thought, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this right? Am I right? Right? I wish so-and-so was here to hear this sermon today, but I would recommend and I would suggest that maybe Jesus is actually saying this is for you today, is for you. And so let me clarify before we move on. Um, Luke made this clear for us already, but Jesus told this parable to people who were struggling with pride he didn't tell it about them he was looking them in the face and so it kind of in this uh in this story now now so here's the parable it's found in luke chapter 18 here's what it says two men went up to the temple to pray one was a pharisee and the other a tax collector now when his listeners heard jesus begin the story they knew exactly they were able to connect they were able to relate immediately because everybody went to the temple two times to pray and jesus sets up the two main characters of the story here we've got a pharisee and a tax collector and there's all kinds of things to disagree on i'm sure uh, in the jewish culture but there were a couple of things that every jew almost all the jews agreed on and that was this a pharisee They were almost always universally respected by all because they had this incredible devotion to the law. They wanted to follow everything that God told them to do. And so they were so focused on new little minutia that their outward actions looked very different than everybody else. And so they stood out. They stood out. Another thing that Jews would have agreed on is when it comes to tax collectors, considered the lowest of the low. Most Jews considered them traitors. They considered them thieves. They considered them betrayers because they worked for the Roman government pulling taxes from their own people. And so what happened was they exploited their own fellow Jews to increase their own wealth. They drove the taxes up, 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 And caused everybody else to live in poverty while they were getting rich on their own people. Especially in the book of Luke here, but throughout some of the scriptures, you'll notice how Luke actually separates the tax collectors from the rest of the sinners. Like he didn't want to insult the rest of the sinners because the tax collectors were that bad. They were the lowest of the low. Now let me me just say, if you happen to work for the IRS and you're here today... Um, don't be offended because you actually end up being the hero of the story. You end up being the star of the story. But just in case, if you're still upset at the end of the sermon today, we have a form that you can fill out. It's about 40 pages long. Uh, If you send it in and everything is perfect on that form, we'll get back to you in about six to eight weeks. How's that? (laughs) Just kidding. Um, You got any grapes? All right, let's go. Come on. So in this story, so in the story, Jesus is portraying polar opposites, Right? He's portraying these polar opposites. There's a Pharisee and there's a tax collector that go to the temple to pray. And his listeners are intrigued by these characters. And the fact that the two characters would be found in the same story. And so they draw what Jesus had to say. So Jesus gets into the story and here's what he says. The Pharisee stood and he prayed by himself. And he said, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. So this this man, this Pharisee, separates himself from all of the 
the evildoers, all of the bad people. And, and he, 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 he starts to brag on himself even. He, he says, I'm not like them. I'm great. I'm not, I'm not like them. I'm great. And where it says that he prayed uh, by himself, a better translation actually would say that he prayed about himself. In fact, many translations actually use that terminology. He said, dear God, I, 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 I am awesome and you're welcome. Like he, he just stopped very, he just stopped short of congratulating God on creating such an amazing person. And so you're seeing here this man's pride and arrogance are on full display. And then another man, and he says this. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his chest and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And here's what this man recognized. Here's what this man recognized that probably the Pharisee didn't. Here's what this man recognized and here's what we need to recognize as well. And that is that going through the motions of religion are never going to heal the deepest places in your heart that are broken Going through the motions of religion are never going to connect you with the life-giving power of Jesus. And this man, this, this tax collector, realized that he is undone before the Lord. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He's not trying to impress any of the listeners. He lays it all out. I don't have it all together. How many of you ever thought that before? I don't have it all together. I admit I, I fall short. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the truth of the matter is that humility is what positions you. It's what positions me. It's what positioned this tax collector to receive God's mercy. In fact, the only thing that can keep you from receiving God's mercy is your unwillingness to admit that you need it. God hates it. arrogance. Arrogance keeps you from receiving what God has for you. He despises it. Now, the parable culminates here, verse 14. It culminates here with a, with a shocking twist. Here's what Jesus says. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God. Now, this, this would have been extremely shocking uh, like a reversal of, of their thinking for all the listeners, especially since, think about it, who is he telling this story to? It's very likely that there were Pharisees in the crowd listening. He's telling it to the people who struggled with pride. So to be justified is to be in right standing before God. It means that you are positioned to receive everything that he has for you. Your relationship with him is good, things are removed, and you've been justified. But the person who would have been perceived to be righteous was rejected by God, the Pharisee. And the one who, the character who uh, would have been known for his wickedness was the one who ended up receiving God's acceptance and so like many of jesus's parables you see how this teaching would have a lot of his listeners like whoa, 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 what's going on here i see i thought and maybe you thought this before see i thought that what you do and how you act is what determines your relationship with god i thought it was how how I behaved. I thought it was the things that I abstained from. I thought, I thought that the more religious I was, the more justified I would be. And Jesus just flips it all the way upside down, doesn't he? And he said, it's not the Pharisee. It's not the religious guy. It's the tax collector. And it's not just because he's a tax collector. It's because what Jesus identified inside of this man's heart it's humility. It's humility. So why was the tax collector justified and not the Pharisee? It's because the tax collector recognized his inability to make himself righteous. 
He couldn't do it himself. The tax collector recognized that he was not enough, apart from God in his life, he was not enough. The tax collector showed the rest of the New Testament, and you read some of the Apostle Paul's writing, you see that he, he uh, relays the same thing. He communicates in the same way. He's the guy who said, listen, I'm the chief of all sinners. <laughs> like, I'm the worst of the worst. I'm nothing apart from God. He's the one who said, I'm not enough. In and of myself, I'm not enough. My sufficiency comes from the Lord. He's the one who makes me enough. And we can't ever lose sight of that humbling truth. Now, there's, there's multiple things. I know there's a lot of things that you could pull from this parable today. There's a lot of things you could learn from here. But what's going on here is that Jesus is showing that pride prevents you from receiving what God has prepared for you. But humility paves the way for God's best in your life. His grace, his goodness, his freedom, his salvation. And just in case the listeners didn't get the point, Jesus closes the parable with this phrase. He says, for all those who exalt themselves, who lift themselves up, who puff themselves up, will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And you start to recognize now the principle behind this whole parable has to do with pride versus humility. Pride versus humility. And these topics, let me tell you, these topics are massive. They are life-shaping, they are kingdom-shaking topics. And in case I didn't emphasize that enough, these topics in your life will make or break you. I want to talk about them before we wrap up this morning. Let's look at this. These, this is why they're so big. Pride. Pride prevents you from receiving what God has prepared for you. It closes the door on what God wants to do in you. It closes the door on what God wants to do through you. And it prevents us from receiving. David said in Psalm chapter 10, he said, In his pride, the wicked man does not even seek God. He's not even interested in his will there's no room for god in his thoughts see pride prevents us from truly seeking god and what he wants for us because we're so busy we're so busy seeking what we want for us here's what pride actually does it deceives us it divides us it dethrones us and it destroys us that he is something but he is nothing he deceives himself pride pride will deceive you and let me tell you there is a there, there is something devastating uh, that starts to happen in our soul when we start to embrace this thinking that we're better than someone else and here's part of what it is it creates this faulty narrative in our mind and in our thoughts of what it means to be holy and we start to think, like the Pharisee, we start to think, if we're not careful, we start to think that it's all about what we do. It's all about our actions. It's all about what we abstain from. It's all about what we participate in. And it creates this faulty narrative of thinking that we're holy because of our greatness, because of our goodness, rather than holiness coming from our humble repentance before a holy God. Pride will absolutely deceive us. It also divides us. Scripture so talks a couple of different places. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is one of them. Um, the the um, disciple Peter wrote this also. Almost identical straight statements. Very strong topics on this. James chapter 4, verse 6 says this very simply. God opposes the proud. He turns his face against them. He is in opposition to pride, and, and, and he sets himself against it. And that's why pride prevents you from receiving what God has for you, because he set his face against you. Now you're in opposition instead of together. Now you have, you have separated yourself. Pride has put you in opposition with the Lord. Pride would perhaps best be uh, pictured as a wedge. 
something that gets driven in. And you notice this, you have experienced this before in your life. On either side of this, you've experienced this before. Pride not only separates you from God, pride also separates you from the ones you love most. It's a wedge. It divides us. Pride also dethrones us. Ultimately, it destroys us. So David, the, the one who's, um, who wrote about his own issues with pride, he, he said this, pride comes before destruction, arrogance before a fall. Pride is 100%. Just in case you, you missed any of the, the things I've been saying here in the last uh, two minutes here, pride is your greatest enemy. Its whole purpose is to bring you down. Its whole purpose is to cut you off. Its whole purpose is to destroy you. Pride is your greatest enemy, but humility, humility is your greatest friend. <laughs> and that's because of this. Humility paves the way for God's best in your life. It puts you in a position to receive everything that God designed for you from the beginning of time. See, there's this second part of the verse that James wrote in James chapter 4. God opposes the proud. Those of you who grew up in church, you, you, maybe you remember this. But he shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. James goes on to say that if you humble yourself before the Lord, he's the one who will lift you up. David, again, the one who said pride comes before destruction. David also wrote in Psalm 18, humility comes before honor. And that's what Jesus is getting to in this whole parable here. He who humbles himself will be lifted up. God always responds to humility. He always responds to humility. Listen, I believe there's a lot of things that God wants to do in you. I believe there's a lot of things that God wants to do through you. And humility is the key. Humility is absolutely the key. Humility paves the way for God's best in your life. And here's what it does. It paves the way for forgiveness. It paves the way for freedom. It paves the way for favor. It paves the way for fullness. Humility paves the way for all that God has for you. And that means one of the most powerful and effective prayers that you could pray is to simply say, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. I'm not enough on my own. I need you. Psalm 69, David said, maybe, maybe this sounds like your journal that you wrote last night. God, I'm in over my head. I need you to come. God, I, I can't handle this. I can't do this on my own. How many of you ever said that before? How many of you ever thought that before? God, I'm in over my head, and I need you to come. See, pride, pride says I'm enough. Humility says only he is enough. I don't need anything. Humility says I desperately need you, God. Pride says everything that I have, this was all because of me. Humility says this was all because of him. And so here's Jesus looking right into the eye of people who talk endlessly about God. They, uh, they parade around uh, talking about God. They're, they're the religious people, and yet they don't now know how to be right with God in their heart because their pride has become a barrier for what God wants to do in their life. But Jesus, in the same story, shows us how humility then paves the way for all that God has for us. So if, if that's you, if that's me, if that's us, if, if that's what we want, if we want God's best, if we want all those things that we listed, if that's truly, truly what we want, humility is the key. And this is what's so great about Jesus. This is what's so great about what Jesus did for me and for you. Jesus paid the price for your pride. He paid the price for my pride. He paid the price for all of our sin. No matter what you've done, one act of just humility and coming before the Lord and God meets you right there. 
But your decision, because there has to be a decision in your heart, in your life, your decision has to be from this day forward, I'm not going to walk like that. From this day forward, pride's going to the curb. From this day forward, my life is going to be lived out with humility. See, your decision has to be from this day forward. That's who we want to be as a church. That's what what we want this place to be, a place where God's best grows in us no matter what season of life it is. And that means this. It means there's no room for pride. There's no room for pride in you. There's no room for pride in me. There's no room for any of that. If we want God's best for this church, if you want God's best for your family, if you want God's best for your business, for your marriage, I got to tell you one more time, there is no room for pride it will keep you from receiving what God has for you if you're here today and you want God's best for your life it all begins by saying yes to following Jesus not by saying yes to religion listen to me not by being a religious person not by attending this church or any other church it begins with a true relationship with God that's what opens the door for God's best in your life and if you're here today and you want that maybe for the very first time or maybe listen can I just be honest with you maybe you feel like you've been a fake Like this relationship with God was all about performance. It was all to make somebody happy. It was all to, 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 for the looks on the outside. You know, Jesus was really hard on the Pharisees. He called them whitewashed tombs. Everything looked good on the outside and it was dead on the inside. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you feel like you've been acting a part. (laughs) There's just nothing alive on the inside. And if that's you, I just want to give you an opportunity to make that decision today. To say yes to Jesus, to begin a real relationship with him, not a religious one, a relationship with him. So I'm going to invite everybody to just take a moment here to close your eyes, bow your heads. This is just a holy moment between you and the Lord. And I'm going to encourage you in this. If, if that's you, if you're ready, just today you want to say yes to Jesus, I encourage you and I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Simple prayer. You can say, God... I love you. I I thank you for loving me. Even when I've been unlovable, you've loved me. And I thank you for sending your son Jesus to take care of my pride issue. Jesus, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins, that you'd give me a brand new start with you at the center of my life now, Lord, that you would be my Lord, that you would be my Savior, that you would take the lead. And I ask that you'd give me the strength and the humility to follow you from this day forward. This is a decision I'm making in my heart, Lord. I give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, listen, let's give it up for those who made that decision today. Man, we are so excited for for you, for what this new life is in front of you. And here's the deal. Um, Uh, Pastor Josh was talking about this just a minute ago. COVID has changed the way that we respond in a lot of different ways. But we want to know if you made that decision today. And we usually use those connection cards. And you know we're not handing stuff around anymore. It just makes it a little bit more difficult. It makes it a little bit more awkward maybe for some people. It makes it a little bit more forward. If you prayed that prayer today, would you just find me? Like, I'm going to be here. Would you just find me? Just, just tell me. In fact, in just a few minutes, we're going to have some prayer teams up front. Would you just find them? Just tell somebody you made that decision. Even if that's it, if you just say, hey, listen, I just want you to know, I said yes to Jesus today. We want to be able to pray for you, want to be able to celebrate, want to be able to encourage you. Because listen, that's what church does. That's what church is about. All right? So let's give it up for those guys one more time. And we're going to wrap up here in a second. Hey, I'm doing good on time. All right? Because you got like a 15-minute song still, right? All right. Hey, listen, uh, one more response. Because if you've been tracking with me, you might be asking this question now. How do I become humble? 
<laughs> how do I be humble? Because as soon as I'm humble, does that like dethrone me? Like I'm the humblest guy I know. That right? Does it? Is there like what do I do? How do I really? How do I really become humble? And, and I just want to encourage you in this. That's a great question. It's a really important question, not one that you should just ask this morning, but it's one that you should live out. How do I live with humility? It's a huge topic of incredible worth. And let me give you one thing today. Let me just give you one thing today. It's a rock solid way that we can embrace humility in our life. And that is this. We can declare the greatness of God and our 100% dependence on him. And when you open that door, when you open that door to the Lord, he can go far beyond anything else that you could do. And so what if this week you paused multiple times this week and you got off that big hamster wheel of your success and how big you are and how great you are. And you got off of that hamster wheel and you took a moment and you were just quiet before the Lord. And you just said, God, I thank you for your greatness. You take some time to worship him. What if you just took some time to admit that you need him? that you're not enough in your own and on your own. Would you guys stand with me? I want to pray over us. And then we're going to sing a final song together before we wrap up our time together. Thank you guys for being with us today. Let's pray. God, there's so many things that we are grateful for. God, there's so many things that we want to see you do in us. We want to see you do through us, God. But, Lord, we're not enough. We need you. We can't earn your blessings. We can't produce life on our own and so God we ask that you would show up in a big way in our lives Lord thank you for thank you for teaching us about humility about the key of humility here and so God we ask that you would start there that you would uproot the pride in our lives that you would dislodge all of the arrogance God and that you would help us to see that all we are and all we have is because of Christ in us and then, God, we ask that you would indeed give us your very best as we pave the way with humility. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's sing. Beginning. I can't control what tomorrow will bring, but I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be. you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again Sing as I walk through the valley. And as I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear. Like the sun shaping the shadows. In my weakness. As your glory appears I'm not enough unless you come will you meet me here again so
Cause all I want is all you 